BK, will you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Great. And you guys can hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Great. So it seems to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. So thanks. I think most of you know me. I'm the curator of Alpine Collections here at Denver Botanic Gardens. It's a little bit crazy, but I've been here now officially 16 years, unofficially 29-ish, if you include all my volunteering time. This is kind of a compendium of some trips I've done over actually the last half decade or so. So we'll start kind of in low elevation down in Oklahoma and then kind of move up in, in elevation. So I threw a map in. I like maps. I think it's good. We know the US fairly well, but we're going to kind of bounce around uh, Oklahoma down there in kind of the south central part of the screen, all the way up to South Dakota and the Black Hills, over to Yellowstone Lake in northwest Wyoming, and then back down into kind of central and northern Colorado, right about where the southern Rocky Mountains lettering is there on the map. So it's a pretty big area. There's about five or six, seven trips to share with you guys. So we'll start in Oklahoma. This is actually where my mom is from. So I have a uh, pretty strong ties to Oklahoma. I get there a fair amount. It's actually a more interesting state than sometimes it gets credit for. When I was growing up, their license plates uh, said, Oklahoma, it's okay. I've noticed that they've now changed those. I think you can get a one if you're actually a Native American or not, you can have that on your license plate. But I think they finally modernized their license plates. It's a really interesting area floristically because it spans a meeting point of a lot of flora. In the Southeastern part of the state, you actually have uh, one native palm and like bald cypress swamps way up there in the northwest corner where Black Mesa is, that's the highest point in Oklahoma, just under 5,000 feet. You have ponderosa pines and pinyon pines and scrub oak, it looks a lot like southern Colorado. And then kind of everything in between going from Colorado to basically Arkansas. So you have Great Plains, you have what they call the Cross Timbers, which is actually kind of near where my mom was born. And then even into parts of the Ozarks, in Washita Mountains with rich, wet, deciduous forests. So it actually has a much richer flora than people uh, give it credit for. It also sits kind of at the cross section of weather for the US. So as we've had more and more weird years here in Denver, I was kind of thinking about all the extremes that plants have to go through in Oklahoma. They have to go through drought like we get. It gets a lot hotter down there but they also get these deluges and have a lot of humidity. So I was like, if plants can live in Oklahoma, a day in Denver or a life in Denver in a garden is probably kind of a piece of cake for them. So with that in 2016, I went for a couple days to Oklahoma in early April. I think that's also kind of colored my picture of Oklahoma as I, I never have been there. Actually, I've only been there once in the summer. I've always gone in kind of the shoulder seasons and uh, the weather is pretty darn decent in the shoulder seasons. But I think if I went in July or August, it might taint my recollections of Oklahoma a little bit. So I drove into central Oklahoma in 2016, stayed in the town of Arvin, which is kind of north central. It's near what's called the Gypsum Hills. And I was specifically looking for of Phlox oklahomensis. Uh, there's actually an endemic phlox in South Central Kansas and Oklahoma, believe it or not. And so this is the habitat through herbarium specimens. I was able to track down the exact locations. About 10 days prior to me arriving, there had been massive fires in this area. And uh, we had big fires here in Colorado last fall. But when I actually looked up the data on one of these fires, the Anderson Creek fire in April, March and April of 2016, actually burned 400,000 acres in Kansas and Oklahoma. So almost twice 
the size of some of the big fires we had this summer. So you can see it torched most of the junipers and elm trees. This is kind of an interesting transition area of forests to Great Plains. And this is on the gypsum or red hills as they call them. So you can see there in the photos how the landscape kind of drops off. You're basically on one of the big, what I kind of call staircases that you either climb or descend as you leave Colorado and head towards the Mississippi. So here we are literally right on the edge of one of those steps. Uh, many people don't think of Oklahoma as having topography like this, but there's probably about two to three, maybe 400 feet of elevation difference in this area. And these ravines are actually steep enough that if I'd fallen down into them, would not have been a good thing. And so the fire burned kind of around this. It was really fascinating. Uh, there are places where I could literally stand with one shoe and a burned part of the prairie and one shoe and the unburned part. But this is what I was after was Phlox oklahomensis. A little Phlox, as I mentioned, that's basically native to a couple counties in Oklahoma and a couple counties in Kansas. It's not considered endangered at the moment. I think it is watched by both states because it was probably never that populous where you find it. And um, it needs pretty specific habitats. It's in undisturbed prairie, which in that part of the Midwest can be pretty hard to find. But you guys saw the topography that it lives in, so that's why it's there. It was very, very hard to find, even with the exact data for the herbarium specimens. And then I remember the description in the Phlox monograph that it's incredibly fragrant. And there's a sentence in there that says that you'll smell it before you see it. So I'd driven all this way and I wasn't finding it. So I just sat down in the grass and just kind of let my nose uh, do, do the work, so to say. And um, after a couple of minutes, I caught a, a really pleasant smell. And so I just kind of followed that down the side of ravine into the grass. So you can see they're mixed in with the little blue stem and big blue stem grass there. It's only about four to six inches tall. In vegetation, that's about two to three feet tall. And then also growing with it was anemone caroliniana, which is a really nice uh, native anemone, kind of like Blanda. So here's a, here's a close up. You can see why it's so difficult to find. I think in that one area, I probably found no more than 10 individuals. And the color varies from white to pale lavender in this population. So after I found it, I felt a little bit better and I could kind of focus on some of the other plants. April's a good time to go to Oklahoma for wildflowers. As you'll see through the program, I promise I'm not being paid by the Oklahoma Travel Board. But um, so Anemone Caroliniana is in there as well. You'll find this in medium to high quality prairies. It's sometimes found in prairie cemeteries. As I mentioned, my family has a long kind of history with central Oklahoma. So there's actually a family cemetery not far from, from the farm that's still in the family. And uh, I remember as a kid, once we went down and the cemetery is actually full of anemone caroliniana and houstonias, the little bluelets. And that just tickled me in high school. It was fun to see all of these prairie wildflowers just growing amongst the headstones. As time went on, uh, the family takes care of the cemetery and they had talked about how they'd really increased the quality of the turf grass in the cemetery. And the last couple of times I've been there, they were very, very proud of, of the turf grass, but I noticed that uh, all the wildflowers had been eradicated probably because they'd put down something like weed and feed or sprayed with 2,4-D. So the last two times I've been there, no more anemone caroliniana in the family cemetery, sadly. Also growing nearby was Allium drummondii. This was up kind of on top of those ravines where the grass was much shorter. Uh, there was buffalo grass and stuff like that up on top of the kind of little mesas 
And so there's a really different kind of aspect of vegetation. So this was a little allium, only about three or four inches tall, but just kind of hanging out there. There was probably about 10 or 12, maybe 15 things in flower in the first couple of days of April there. And then after I found the flocks, I wanted to head down to the Wichita Mountains, which are in southwestern Oklahoma. So by then I had navigation on my phone. So it took me all these back roads that I had never been on. So I got to go through some kind of scenic parts of Oklahoma, where my mom grew up is actually super flat, what everyone thinks of Oklahoma. But these are more of those gypsum or red hills with actually mesquite trees. This is kind of west central Oklahoma. And then kind of nearing the Wichita Mountains, there's an area of limestone. So anytime you find real rocky areas in the prairie, they couldn't plow that. So you're probably going to have fairly high quality vegetation. So here's Allium drummondii again in full bloom, probably about 100, 200 miles south of where we saw it in the other slide. There's an unknown white mustard in there. I think it's a Lescarella. I haven't, I tried to key it out and I, I actually haven't been able to key it out. And then the wind does blow in Oklahoma a lot. So you will find a lot of windmills now and kind of the distance up on the hills and stuff, just like in Kansas and Nebraska and Wyoming. And then along the roadside down there, it was, spring was a little more advanced. Trees were starting to leaf out. Uh, there was Verbenia or Glandularia bipinnatifida. This is in the Plant Select program. I've actually maybe only seen it in Colorado once. It was all along the roads. Very, very pretty. And then these are actually the Wichita Mountains. Uh, Oklahoma has a few more mountains than people give it credit for. It's actually a lot more topography there than, say, Kansas or Nebraska. Uh, Kansas doesn't have a ton of major rivers cutting through it. So it hasn't been cut down like parts of Oklahoma. And Nebraska's actually been kind of cut down by the Platte River and then buried under the sand hills and stuff like that. So that's one reason that Nebraska and Kansas don't have as much topography as Oklahoma. And then Oklahoma actually has had some mountain building in the past. So there was an interesting kind of conversation on Facebook when I posted this. Some people called it a hill. And that's probably true. It only rises about 800 feet above the surrounding landscape. And by some definitions of a mountain, it has to rise 1,000 feet. But then I came across a definition that I liked a little bit better between mountain and hill. And it said mountains are actually formed from tectonic uh, ways and hills are erosional. So most of what you have in Kansas would be hills because they are literally just the sediment being eroded away. But this is actually part of an ancient mountain range that may even predate the Appalachians that kind of runs through from Western Texas all the way into the Ozarks and Washitas of um, Missouri and Arkansas. And these were formed a long time ago, eroded down and then were actually buried under sediment during the Cretaceous period when uh, the central part of the US was that intercoastal seaway that laid down a lot of fossils that we see here in places like Wyoming and Colorado. So these have actually been eroded back to the surface. And um, most of the mountain range is still actually underneath the surface in Oklahoma and Texas. It kind of pops up here and there. So the Wichita Mountains are actually some of the highest parts that are poking through. And then going up into them once again, because they're rugged and it is actually a wildlife sanctuary, it's fairly undisturbed prairie again. So you get things like masses of Amsonia, which were in bloom, these were quite nice. This is a really popular place for Oklahomans to go on the weekend, and I think I was there on a weekend, and it was actually nuts. The top of the parking lot on the mountain was like Pikes Peak or Mount Evans. 
in July or August. There was almost no parking. There were parking directors. There were tour buses dropping people off. But on the way up, no one was stopping for the masses of wildflowers. So I could stop and basically have peace. So here's a close up. This is tentatively Tabernay, Montana is listed for the park. These are much smaller than the versions we grow here at VBG, which may be from points further east. It may also just be that these are in a fairly dry area for Tabernay, Montana. So they're, they're pretty small. They were only about 12 to 16 inches tall. And there were literally thousands of them in this pasture, including one white individual. Driving up Mount Scott, so that's the highest point there in the Wichita Mountains. Quite rocky, as you can see, so they're granitic with oaks and junipers. And then kind of halfway up the mountain, sumacs and oaks have started to leaf out. And then the actual top of the mountain. So if you look in the far kind of left-hand corner of the screen, you can see some of the cars. And like many mountaintops, you don't have to walk very far to get away from the crowds. Most people were just up there to be on probably what is arguably one of the most notable peaks in Oklahoma and one of the easiest to get to because it has a road to the top. The highest point, Black Mesa, does not have a road to the top. You actually have to climb. Looking to the southwest, kind of out over the rest of the Wichita Mountains and maybe even beyond to what they call the Glass Mountains, which are part of that same mountain range. And then it's barely exposed on top, so there's almost these crumholtz of juniper on top. You don't really think of crumholtz in Oklahoma, but they have crumholtz as well. And actually in 2004, when I first went to this part, about the same time, maybe a month earlier, the top of Mount Scott was actually closed because of high winds. So I couldn't go up there. And actually the whole county, as I was driving out there on the radio came on that the whole county needed to take shelter because there were rain wrapped tornadoes kind of dancing across. And so I pulled into the visitor center and uh, asked the ranger where, where we should shelter. <laughs> and he's like, oh, we don't need to shelter. Those, those tornadoes aren't gonna, gonna come here. But I'm like, uh, they, they're asking the whole county <laughs> to seek shelter. And so for about 20 minutes, there was a pretty good thunderstorm that um, lashed the visitor center, but it, it worked out. And then when I went back out into the park on that trip, most of the roads were closed because it had rained so heavily. So the streams that were normally dry or just trickles were rushing across the road. So this was a much more peaceful trip minus the crowds. So you trade a couple things, I guess. But um, coming back down into areas off Mount Scott, there's richer soil, so you get forest of bur oak and stuff like that. Always very pretty. You can tell that I'm from the treeless part of the prairie. It's like, ooh, trees. And then I spotted this out of the car, something pink in the distance. And it's a kind of Ceres richenbachii, the lace cactus. Oklahoma is probably the major range for this plant. It does come up into the Arkansas Valley of Colorado and goes down into Texas and probably New Mexico. And I was there early enough that there's just one or two flowers as I kind of flirted about the population, but that definitely made the trip down to the Wichita's worthwhile. And then just some of the other flora. So there's Castilea. Supposedly this is Cecilia flora, which we get here in Colorado on the plains. Down there, they were all this very yellow green color. And then I'm, I'm lazy and I haven't keyed out that Erigeron. I'll have to work on that, but there were Erigerons. And then a Lomadium Phoenicium, which is kind of one of the common Lomatians or Lomadiums of the Great Prairie, a very nice little parsley relative. And then what really stopped me in my tracks, this is how things like Amsonias and Baptisias let me know that I'm no longer on the Eastern Plains of Colorado. 
because those aren't really native to this part of Colorado. So there's Baptisia bracteata in some of those meadows as well in full bloom. And then the, on the left of the screen, that pinky one is a hybrid. And then I couldn't find any other species around, but I think Australis is listed for the park. So that is probably a hybrid between Australis and Bracteata. Just one of those hanging out amongst the other yellow ones. And I've killed more of this Baptisia than any other Baptisia. It seems to be kind of tricky to get established and other people are kind of saying that as well when I read stuff online. So it's like, okay, that's good to know. I'm not a complete doofus. But I, I really like this species. It has been used in hybridization for some of the yellow and kind of cream colored ones. And then uh, after I finished at the Wichita Mountains, I headed east and I had picked out a little hotel in a historic town in kind of South Central Oklahoma. But when I got there, it was completely closed. <laughs> no one answered the door. So I had to drive up the road a bit to a casino. So I spent the night in the hotel at a casino. And uh, they were like, are you going to gamble? And I'm like, no. And they're like, what, what are you here for? <laughs> and I said, uh, I'm actually here to visit the Arbuckle Mountains tomorrow morning. This is another range in South Central Oklahoma between Oklahoma City and Dallas. So if you've ever driven between those two cities, the highway actually goes right up over these. And there's a scenic viewpoint or two. But uh, if you go into the actual park, once again, this is a park for Oklahoma residents. You can actually go up on to the highest point. This is about a thousand feet lower than the Wichita Mountains. So this is only about 1,400 feet above sea level now. And what's kind of cool about the Arbuckles is as soon as I got up in them, it was like a combination of the Ozarks meets New Mexico. So on the very tops, it was fairly dry with junipers and big prickly pear cactus and even yuccas, fairly treeless. But as you can see, kind of looking down into the ravines, there's things like oaks and probably even hickories and stuff like that. So it's kind of this fascinating uh, east meets west, truly. And I like areas like that. And once again, because it was April and early in the morning, I literally had the entire park to myself. There wasn't another car in the parking lot, I think, the entire time I was there. When I paid the entry fee, they asked if I was going to go swimming. And I said, probably not. So I think it's a big, uh, there's some public pools there. So it sounds like it's pretty popular once it gets hot. Some of the flowers there, a violet I need to key out. Castlea coccinia isn't just native to hill country of Texas. It does come up into Oklahoma. Along with the blue bonnets, there actually weren't any blue bonnets on this trip. And then a little Linaria species, and this may be the species that actually appears here in Colorado, which I think is Canadensis. So once again, tons of little wildflowers, probably 15 to 25 species of flowers if I poked around. But I was there to kind of see the, the trees as well. So you have a upland oak forest there, left-hand side of the screen, probably with some hickory mixed in. And then, um, I'm kind of a juniper nerd. Uh, growing up in Colorado, I never liked juniper as much as a kid. But in college, I came into the light and learned to love junipers. So junipers ashii is native here and into the Ozarks and down actually into Texas Hill Country. So I was trying to check off as many North American junipers as I can. So this allowed me to do that. There are some beautiful ashy eyes up on top of these mountains. And then some more of the flora. Coreopsis lanceolata was already in bloom along the highway kind of scenic overlook. I'm not sure if it was actually native to that site. Oklahoma does a lot of uh, highway reseeding with wildflowers like a lot of Midwestern states. So it may have come in on that, you never know. And then it was kind of fascinating. This is probably one of the easternmost uh, populations of the lace cactus again. 
And ironically, these weren't in flower yet. You can see they have some little flower buds there on top. But it was kind of funny to see that the ones that were a thousand feet higher were already coming into flower. And these at a lower elevation, but uh, probably about 200 miles east weren't in flower yet. And then that meadow photo, believe it or not, is actually there's Mullenbergia reversionii in the meadows there. And this is the plant select undotted ruby molly grass. And I did pull up a little, little division of it and brought it back and nursed it. And it's not quite as colorful as Lauren's selection. Uh, Lauren just has an eye and a knack for that kind of stuff. She always finds the best forms. But I, I do have a little while collected Mullenbergia at, at my house. And so that's kind of fun. I like data behind things. That's probably part of being a curator. And then uh, one of the main attractions of the Arbuckle Mountains is actually, I think this is Arbuckle Falls, if I remember right. So the area is limestone again. So tremendous amount of limestone in Oklahoma, Arkansas. And so you actually get pretty cool limestone topography. It's pretty rugged. And then uh, there's springs popping up actually through the Arbuckle Mountains. It's kind of bizarre that you actually have these springs on top of these mountains, basically. So I'm not sure how that's entirely happening because there's not much catchment area above the springs. So the water is definitely being forced up. And you get travertine because the water has dissolved the limestone on its way up. And then it deposits it back out in these streams. So this is actually from the highway overlook. If you pull off onto the scenic, a little overlook there, you can look down onto Arbuckle Falls. Of course, I climbed down to it because there's a hiking trail, but the best view, of course, is from the highway. And then um, a little plug, as many of you know, uh, in two weeks, we're going to have a crevice workshop through NARGS with five or six of the best crevice builders in North America. But um, just in case you were worried about what you can grow in your crevice garden, if, if you've always wondered if poison ivy was appropriate for crevice gardens, here's proof. It is a great chasmophyte uh, for crevice gardens. So you can definitely put that into your crevice garden if you'd like next spring. As we know, it gets great fall color. It's good at keeping kids away. So I just wanted to throw that in. And then we're getting ready to leave Oklahoma and head north. So this is near where my mom grew up in Enid, Oklahoma. These are canola fields, I think. They're either canola or rapeseed. I, I can't tell the difference, to be honest. But they actually grow a fair amount of this stuff in central Oklahoma. Uh, this is, I think, what a lot of people think of. It's, it's fairly flat. It's largely been modified by agriculture. Luckily, the family farm borders the Cimarron River. So there's actually a series of dunes that runs through part of the family farm. So even though it's been manipulated, there's still a fair amount of native vegetation on the farm. Lots of poison ivy too. So we'll leave Oklahoma now and head north. Uh, we're going to skip a year. Most of you know that between that Oklahoma trip and this trip, I did a master's in environmental biology at Regis. So there weren't a ton of trips in between. But then in 2018, I kind of got back on the road. So in September of 2018, we did an actual joint collection trip between some of the regional botanic gardens here in Colorado. And then Wojciech Holjebeck was visiting from the Czech Republic and had wanted to go to Wyoming. So it was kind of the perfect storm. So members from DBG, Gardens on Spring Creek, and Yampa River Botanic Park joined us on this trip. Betty Ford Alpine Gardens was written into the agreement for the germplasm collected on this trip with the National Forest. But Nick Cortens wasn't actually on this trip, but they have plants from this trip. So we went to the Beartooth in the Bighorn Mountains in northern Wyoming, which I think many of you have been there over the years. 
hands down one of the best areas in the Rockies for wildflowers and interesting plants. Late September is a good time for fall color. We weren't there during peak flower. We were there the last week of September, which was fairly good for seed collecting. So things like Physocarpus malvifolius, uh, one of the native nine barks, was pretty stunning plant. If you go by in the summer, it's just kind of a sleeper green plant in the background. It's like, okay, cool, another nine bark. But actually in the fall, it kind of made us literally stop the car and get out and see what it was about. And then the Salix glauca up on the actual bear tooth were in fall color, a bunch of the alpine plants up there. We did about 120 seed collections on this trip over about five days, if I remember right. So it was a fairly productive trip. And then just kind of a, a landscape shot. There was a cold front coming down from the north on the first day we were on the bear tooth. So it was literally fun to watch it approach because it literally was lapping up the mountains. You could kind of watch the clouds literally rise and eventually envelop us through the day. And in the afternoon, we drove down to Red Lodge at the base and Red Lodge was al already in the heart of the cold front. It was freezing drizzle down there and very cold. While still on the bear tooth, it was, it was tolerable because it was still largely above the inversion that was coming. But by the next day, we went back to the bear tooth and it had snowed. So our, our luck had changed a little bit. Uh, some of the plants we saw and collected on this trip that would interest you guys was Saxifraga opisifolia. Paniotti told me about this population and gave us really good directions. So we were able to find it. This was fun for me. I've seen this plant in Europe, ironically, but never in North America. And um, it's literally kind of not too far out the back door. So it was, it was fun to see that. And then uh, Douglasia montanas, fairly common in the Beartooth and Bighorns, and maybe comes down into the Wind Rivers. Both of these don't make it to Colorado. One little last flower on there for Wojciech. Wojciech wanted more flowers, uh, which I, I can understand coming all the way from the Czech Republic. He was hoping there would be a lot more flowers, but I'm like, well, we there's ripe seed on stuff. So generally we can't have our cake and eat it too, sadly. And then leaving kind of Wyoming, that part of Wyoming for now, we're gonna head over to the Black Hills. In 2019, Michael Geedy, who's often on a lot of these collection trips with me and a tremendous support. Without him, these trips wouldn't be as successful as they are. He's good at logistics. He's good at handling anything that can pop up. Uh, he's good at handling me, which sometimes could be a full-time job in itself. So we headed up through uh, central Wyoming. Here we are on the plains near Guernsey, looking at some Artemisia species. I think it's a form of Tridentata. We never truly keyed it out actually been run over by the highway mowers. So that makes it kind of hard to fully key things out. And then the hills there in the distance, you can't see because it's too far out, but that's some of the southernmost populations of Juniperus horizontalis, the creeping juniper, a really common landscape plant kind of almost looked down upon. But there's a lot of interesting forms of it here throughout the American West. And most of what's sold in the trade actually comes off the East Coast. So these forms are incredibly drought tolerant. And some of my colleagues, Mike Bone and Kevin Williams, have specifically collected these forms from Guernsey and points beyond. And then this is in the actual Black Hills. The Black Hills are a great trip. You can make it there in about six hours, depending on how fast you drive and how often you stop. And we had some really good hosts there that helped us with stuff. So they were set up basically to show us around, show us the great spots. They took us immediately down Brush Creek once we arrived. And we were all kind of gobsmacked by Agastache finicium, which is actually native in Colorado as well. I've never seen it here. It's fairly rare right along the front of the front range. 
there it's very plentiful and i'm like stop the car and tom and rob our hosts were like why and i'm like because there's an agastaki and they're like oh that's really common and we're like well we still want to see it and um so we got out of the car and amy schneider who also came on this trip michael and i were just completely enraptured with this bluish agastaki it's in the trade it's sold it's not rare but it was fun to see it in the wild and the form in the black hills is a little more graceful than maybe what's in cultivation tom and rob still tease me about this they're like you guys were so excited about that and we're like that's old hat and then they'll show me something that they're excited about and i'm like oh we have thousands of that in colorado and they're actually better specimens so it's always what you don't have Here's Michael Giddy in Brush Creek with Echinacea angustifolia. Cool thing about the Black Hills is like Oklahoma, they're truly a meeting point of flora. There's stuff from the far north, stuff from the Rockies, there's stuff from points east, stuff from points south. So you get this kind of cool combination of prairie plants with ponderosa pines in a lot of areas. And then this is on another creek they took us to because I was specifically looking at a lot of things that are disjunct from the eastern US, a lot of woodies, things like bittersweet vine, uh, bur oak, paper birch, ironwood, stuff like that. There's even ferns. I never keyed this out. And then the next day they took us to the northwest part of the Black Hills, which are even wetter. So 2019 was a super wet year for the Black Hills. Uh, Tom and Rob, our host, said that they'd had about 40 inches of precipitation by the time we arrived in late August. So stuff was super, super green. I was, you can definitely tell I'm from Colorado and used to dryness because I was just kind of over the moon with how green it was, how lush things were, how many flowers there were still for the last week of August. This is Upper Spearfish Canyon. Once again, this is a limestone area. The Black Hills are really cool because there's a lot of geology there. There's a granitic core surrounded by a bunch of sedimentary rocks ranging from sandstone to limestone and shale. There's things like schist. Pretty much almost any type of rock you could want is generally somewhere in the Black Hills. And it's kind of arranged like an onion, like if you cut the top of an onion off, the center of the onion would be kind of the granitic core. And then each layer is kind of one of those sedimentary or metamorphic layers surrounding it. And so this is technically in one of those more outer layers, the limestone layer. So once again, anytime you have limestone and water and springs, you get travertine. So Upper Spearfish Canyon has these travertine terraces in it that the creek flows over. And then that's a forest of Black Hill spruce, uh, Picea glauca. So this would be one of those disjunct plants from the boreal forest that got pushed south during the Pleistocene and things are nice enough in the Black Hills that it stayed around. For a long time, it was considered a variety of white spruce, but then someone actually did some genetic work on it. And I guess there's actually no genetic difference between the Black Hill spruce and the white spruce that grows around where my dad grew up in Northern Michigan. So the, it's no longer considered a variety. It's just Picea glauca with a South Dakota accent. We were in Upper Spearfish Canyon because there's a lot of fun stuff in there. It is truly like going to Northwest Montana or even into the boreal forests of Canada. So I'm into all kinds of plants, uh, including viburnums. This viburnum is native to Colorado, but it's fairly rare. And actually there in Spearfish Canyon, it's fairly common. And so we were there to see if we could collect seed off of it and just how many individuals there were. And then some of the other flora, late August is not prime time for flora there, but Lilium philadelphicum was in seed. 
a true plant nerd plant there center screen is Helenia deflexa. It's actually a gentian relative. Um, it's just finishing flowering, so that's about as exciting as it gets. It's a uh, American spurred gentian, or sometimes also called, I think, green spurred gentian, because the flowers tend to be greenish. Total plant nerd moment there. I was really happy to finally see that plant. And then Spirea betulifolia, which also is found in Wyoming and Montana, makes it out to the Black Hills. Just some of the habitat showing how wet it is. So there's basically moss and things like Cornus canadensis, which you find in Michigan, where my dad grew up, or in Canada, and even Linnea, uh, the twin flower there, which is another boreal plant. We do have both of these in Colorado, but they tend to be in pretty specific habitats. The whole side of the canyon is just one continuum of this habitat. There's Amy Schneider. She's a great colleague as well. She does a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. She doesn't get her day in the sun enough. She was great to have on this trip too. She did a lot of the logistical stuff. She was keeping detailed notes on what we saw, where we saw it. So here she is kind of pondering the flora there in Upper Spearfish Canyon. It's on one of the benches. So there's steep limestone sides, obviously that's why it's called Upper Spearfish Canyon. So we had climbed up the side of the canyon to get to this bench. So most of the habitat was not this flat. It's, it was so steep actually that like I was immediately above Amy anytime we were going up the slope and it's like, oh crap, if I fall, I'm gonna take Amy out. Luckily we didn't fall that day. And then after that, they took us to Flag Mountain, which is in the west part. It's limestone again. It's kind of famous for a couple things. One of the native flocks, Phlox alicifolia is up here. Clematis columbiana veraditenia loba is also up here. A lot of cool rock ferns. There was this beautiful rainbow as we were up there. A thunderstorm kind of rolled over. I was a little nervous. They weren't quite as uh, freaked out as I was. I think that's probably the Coloradan in me. It's like, I don't want to be on the highest point as a thunderstorm rolls over. But um, obviously, everything worked out. Uh, the next day, they took us to Hell Canyon. This is in the southwest part of the Black Hills. Once again, limestone. Uh, it's not surprising that a lot of our time was spent in the limestone areas because it's so rich. This area burned, I think, in 2000, and it was the largest fire to date in the Black Hills. I think it burned something like 180,000 acres. So here's just andropogon, the big blue stem, not rare, but as I mentioned, it was a beautiful wet year, so the grasses were really luxuriant in 2019 in the Black Hills, and it was the best of both worlds, mountains with prairie. I think that's how I would sum up the, the Black Hills with northern disjuncts. I didn't put it in, but there's even a small population of cranberry in the Black Hills, and I got to see that this fall with the botanist. It's only about 10 by 10 feet, and it's the only patch of cranberry between Minnesota and Montana. Some of the stuff in Hell's Canyon, once again, not necessarily anything super, super rare. Liatris punctata, which we have here in Colorado. It's our very common liatris. But we did find some white individuals. And I, this fall when I went back, we were able to collect seed off the white individuals. We don't know if they'll come true, but it would be fun to have a white liatris punctata. There's also Symphalotrichon oblongifolia, the aromatic aster, is there. This is what uh, Claude Barr selected his dream of beauty, a pink cultivar from, and it was introduced in 1960. It's hard to go to the Black Hills and not mention Claude Barr. Many of you know him. He wrote the book, Jewels of the Plains, and he lived not far from the Black Hills in Smithwick, South Dakota, and he did a lot of landmark work with Western prairie natives and probably knew the prairie and its flora almost better than 
anyone alive at his time. Some of the limestone again. So if you look kind of close, there's actually rock ferns and golden rods and all kinds of stuff in there. Even some poison ivy is creeping around in spots. So you had to be kind of careful that you just didn't run off into the vegetation. And once you caught sight of something you wanted to see a little bit closer, you had to check around a bit. A uh, form of Chelanthes, I can't remember which species this is, but they were quite plentiful and looking quite good because of the rain. And then they took us to Battle Creek. So this is in the Eastern Black Hills, basically behind Rapid City. Battle Creek is actually part of the water supply for Rapid City. There's not a lot of big streams in the Black Hills, partially because of the topography and geology. I think there's a lot of underground water with that limestone. So actually Upper Spearfish Creek, which you guys saw there, is actually the largest above ground stream in the Black Hills. Battle Creek isn't real big, but you get things like uh, Baroque along it again. And then we were there because it's home to Australia Virginiana, the hop hornbeam, which is native uh, in the Eastern deciduous forest. It's even a component where my dad grew up in Michigan. And I think it's even a component down in far Eastern Oklahoma. It's kind of one of those unsung trees of the Eastern deciduous forest because it's always an understory tree. And that's how it likes to be. It wants to hang out under other trees. It doesn't need to be the star of the show. But here in the West, it actually isn't always an understory tree. It, it's along the creeks kind of hanging out with the oaks and the cottonwoods. And these Western populations are much more heat and drought tolerant, I've been told. So we were there to see those. I like sunflowers. I, any sunflower is kind of sacred. So here's Helianthus gracioculatus the Satu sunflower. I don't think we have this in Colorado. It's kind of a Midwest thing. Makes its final appearance in the Black Hills. There's Amy in the distance. You can see how wet it was. The grass is incredibly lush. And actually a lot of it had been matted down because Battle Creek had flooded a couple times prior to our visit. You get things like paper birch and the Eupatorium maculatum. Both of these are native uh, where my dad grew up in Michigan. So it was kind of fun to see these in South Dakota. That's kind of the beauty of the Black Hills. There were moments where it's like, am I in Colorado with the Ponderosa Pines? And then I'd turn around and on a north facing slope with the birch, I could be back in Michigan. Or if I was in a spruce forest, I could be in Alaska. Or if we were out in Hell's Canyon in the full sun with the prairie grasses, you could be anywhere in the Western US. Uh, Cindy Reed was also one of our hosts for this trip. She's actually our member at large for non-metro for RMC NARGS. She's a life force and she probably knows about as much about the plants in that part of the world as anyone. Her and her husband have started the Great Plains Botanic Garden about 20 minutes south of Rapid City in a rural location on a private ranch. It's not actually her ranch. It's another a rancher who's basically lent the land in a lease to the botanic garden. And so Cindy's pointing something out here. They have some beds around the visitor center showcasing some of the native flora. And here's some of the landscape. I think the true crown jewel of this botanic garden is that it actually sits on fairly undisturbed prairie. And so it doesn't really even need gardens. The actual attraction is the prairie itself that surrounds the visitor center. So we were able to kind of wander the prairie. Once again, it had been a very wet year, so the grass was almost waist high on me. And then uh, in recent years with funds, I think our chapter maybe actually gave a small donation if I remember correctly. They built or actually moved this uh, settler's log cabin to the site to be the visitor center. So this is an original 
log cabin built with uh, juniper, western red cedar there, juniper's virginiana, and they moved it to the site. Uh, they spent a couple months trying to find a building that would work perfectly. And finally, someone told Cindy that they knew of a building that didn't have a roof. And so they arranged to have it moved to the site. The site's pretty cool. It has a lot of variety of habitat. There's rock outcroppings, there's wetlands. This is one of the rock outcroppings with a bunch of native grasses. And you can maybe see the seed heads of Echinacea and Gustafolia. There's Artemisia in there. There's actually a little kind of serious Viridiflorus hanging out. That's one thing you had to watch. The grass was tall enough. You wanted to just kind of sit in it because it looks so soft. But there are actually prickly pears and little um, ball cactus hiding under some of those grasses. So you needed to once again check where you sat. It had been so wet that the pond was about as full as anyone had ever seen it. And it was full of uh, frogs and mosquitoes and all healthy webs of life. But uh, really interesting plants there too, even in that wetland environment, including uh, the plant at the top of the screen. I need to email this actually to our curator of aquatic collections because I've never been able to key out what this little round leaf plant with uh, white flowers was. I've never seen anything like that. Theoretically, it's got to be native in this environment. I don't see many invasive plants making it to this pond in southwestern South Dakota, but you never know. A beautiful rock outcrops at the edge of the pond as well. That one is actually an island that Michael and I were able to hop onto. And then um, the 2019 trip was not actually a seed collecting trip. It was actually kind of a planning slash exploration trip, which was kind of nice to do. I'd like to do more of that in the future where you actually just get to go and kind of scope out the best spots, uh, the spots that maybe you thought were great that actually aren't great. Also it gives you a little bit of time to process what you wanna collect and don't wanna collect. Sometimes when I'm just sent out of the shotgun basically to go collect, I'll collect a ton of stuff and it's like, okay, it all has value. But when I start growing it out, it's like, oh God, why, why did I actually collect that? We have 10 accessions of that already at the gardens. It's not any different than maybe what we have. Or sometimes in hindsight, it's like, why didn't I collect that? Uh, we don't have much of that at BBG. So these kind of planning trips allow a bit of digestion actually of what what you see on a trip, because it's so easy to get seed happy and just shove every ripe seed into a bag and head home. So this year was obviously a fascinating year with COVID. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And DBG initially canceled my trip and put me on another set of trips and then canceled all trips because of COVID, understandably. And then a private donor came through and I was able to kind of largely go out the back door and, and actually finish this trip because we had all the parts of the puzzle together. I had the permitting was done. We had taken a year to work on the permitting with the Forest Service botanist. She was actually able to come out with me in 2020 and collect with me. Uh, we could kind of discuss some programmatical stuff going forward for DBG and the Black Hills National Forest. But as we know, the best laid plans of mice and men always end up kind of in interesting places. So I set out, I actually had to delay my trip a day because uh, the roads in Wyoming <laughs> were closed by that early September snowstorm that we had. And Tom and Rob who were my hosts again and actually lived there in the Black Hills, were sending me photos the day before I was originally going to leave of 10 inches of snow at their house. And I'm like, oh, lovely. We have all the permits and all our I's are dotted, our T's are crossed, and now there's 10 inches of snow on everything. But I went um, two days later and the snow had largely started to melt. 
And so we were able to do a fair amount of collecting in all the areas that we had wanted to. The photo on the left was not caused by the snowstorm. In the Northwest Black Hills, they actually get uh, tornadoes, I guess every year. And so this is the aftermath of a tornado that happened a couple years ago, took down a bunch of big ponderosa pines. And actually I didn't throw it in, but they drove me through an area on this trip that had just been hit by tornadoes this past summer. And it was fascinating to see what a tornado does in canyon topography with fully wooded canyon sides. It basically leveled the forest. And so we're gonna leave the Black Hills and kind of focus here closer to home. Uh, there's discussion to continue working with the Black Hills National Forest on some germplasm collection and stuff like that. It's such an interesting area as I alluded to. It also makes it easy to do some conservation work for them. They have a couple rare willows where there's literally less than 10 individuals in the wild. So it would actually be really easy for Denver Botanic Gardens to back up every single one of those willows. So if something ever happens, we could offer cuttings back. Or ironically, limber pine is incredibly rare there. There's something like seven mature individuals of limber pine in the Black Hills. And so once again, we've discussed a project that maybe DBG could back up literally carbon copies of all seven individuals that we could always offer back as grafted material. So we've been kind of discussing stuff like that going forward. It, it makes it easy when the area is that small and has that few individuals because you can capture the entire genetic diversity behind the population. Well, sometimes here in Colorado, there's argument outside of seed banking, can we actually hold the entire genetic diversity in a living collection? And that's a discussion for another day. So coming back home to Colorado, uh, we weren't allowed to do much travel this year. We could do local day trips. And with Betty Ford Alpine Gardens, DBG and the US Forest Service have been working behind the scenes on the North American Botanic Garden Strategy for Alpine Plant Conservation. So over the last almost three years with Nicola, some of my colleagues here, we've been drafting a 16 page document to hopefully guide botanic gardens here in Canada, the US and Mexico on actually conserving our alpine flora. And not surprisingly, it focuses on what we call in situ conservation, which is conserving plants in their native habitats. And uh, with alpine plants, that makes the most sense. And ironically, just yesterday, I got the final copy of that document. So shortly here, we'll probably be sharing that widely uh, with various groups. But uh, Betty Ford Alpine Gardens had already received some funding to actually go out and start do some seed banking uh, with this project and also to go in and kind of look at the condition of certain alpine areas. So we actually started going out and visiting some of these areas of concern in Colorado. These areas are monitored through the Colorado Heritage, Natural Heritage Program. Uh, they were picked at some point for having high biodiversity and being good areas to conserve. So we went in and we're actually kind of grading these areas. And it was the first summer, so I think we have some work to do on our grading scale, but kind of after visiting some of them with the technician from Betty Ford Alpine Gardens, I'd kind of walk away and be like, I'd give that area a B minus, or I'd give that area a, a C plus uh, for these various reasons that it's trampled in certain areas or I'd give that area an A actually because there's no social trails. Uh, everyone's staying on the trail. Vegetation's fairly intact. There's no parking lots in the middle of it, stuff like that. 
but behind the scenes, I was also working on a couple of years ago because I'm a, a hyper nerd. I had created a list of what I call Colorado's charismatic alpine flora that I hadn't seen in real life. And it was really only about 15 or 20 species of fairly showy plants native to Colorado in the alpine tundra that I actually hadn't seen. So I was secretly working to check some of these off and a lot of these fall into some of those areas we were visiting. So we were able to find a Ridgeron humulus on Hoosier Pass this summer. All inch and a half of it. And it was super exciting. This was probably one of the more exciting moments of the summer was finally stumbling upon this little guy. It actually, it's so small and maybe on the edge of charismatic that I had knelt down to photograph Gentiana prostrata, which many of you know Gentiana prostrata, it's probably our smallest gentian. So I was kneeling down to photograph that and then I noticed a Ridgeron humulus was mixed in with it. It's definitely not something you're gonna see from six feet away. Here's the part of the group on, Betty, on Hoosier Ridge with um, Betty Ford Alpine Gardens. Uh, Nicole Cosmary was their actual conservation intern for the summer. I was hoping they could keep her on. I don't think they've been able to. Nicole is one of those really awesome young people that you come across. We tell her about the plant we were looking for for the day and inevitably Amy and I and the other technician from Betty Ford would be kind of scanning and Nicole would be like, hey, what's What's this plan up here? And I'm like, that's exactly what we were looking for. So she definitely has the eye for this kind of stuff or maybe even the nose. She so many times was the one that actually found what we were looking for. So there we are hanging out, Hoosier Ridge. And these were some of the plants we were looking for that day, Papaver cluinense. It's a nice typo there I just noticed. Uh, the alpine poppy is actually a little more plentiful in Colorado than I initially thought. We found quite a few individuals that day. And then we are also looking for the armeria. And of course, Nicole found both of these. She's like, what's that? I'm like, oh, that's the alpine poppy. She's like, what's that? I'm like, that's the alpine sea thrift. I haven't seen that for 20 years. And uh, so it's fun to kind of reconnect with both of these plants. As you guys know, it's a fairly dry summer. So I think it wasn't quite as florific up there as maybe it had been in previous years. I was actually trying to recreate this shot from 2015 with Papaver cluinense. They weren't this charismatic last summer. So this photo will have to stay in the archives is the best photo I have of Papaver cluinense. And then I threw this in. We've seen this many, many times, but this is kind of an exciting update. Many of you know that my colleague, Jennifer Ackerfield, who wrote The Floor of Colorado and is now our curator of the herbarium here, has been doing her PhD on the alpine thistles of Colorado. And she actually just defended here not too long ago. So she actually has the title of Dr. Ackerfield now. And she's getting ready to publish some of her findings. And she actually found within Circium scopulorum, which is kind of that big charismatic alpine thistle, that there's at least two species. And so the yellow flowered form is actually broken out now through genetic work as its own species. And it, this is Circium funkii. I think this has officially been published. It's Funk's thistle, and she named this for her advisor in her PhD program, who sadly did pass away, I think, a year or two ago. And so now we have Circium funkii in the Alpine Tundra of Colorado, which will be a fun addition. Uh, stay tuned. She's going to be putting out a couple other species, and there's still a lot of work to be done with the thistles of the American West. She did a presentation in September for CONIPS called This Will Be Fun. 
kind of untangling some of Colorado's uh, prickly messes. So stay tuned. We'll probably gain, I'm guessing, at least five or six new thistle species. And then a little bit after that, I went to West Maroon Pass. Michael Giddy had been there uh, in July and said it was fabulous. And I have never done a ton of work around Crested Butte. So this was kind of a, a test during COVID to see if I could travel and not contract COVID. So I went to Crested Butte for a couple of days, stayed in a hotel, did day hikes, ate outside, was actually kind of developing a plan for South Dakota. So it worked out and the flowers were still very good the first week of August on West Maroon Pass. This is just fireweed, but very beautiful. I went there because also on that list of charismatic alpine plants I've not seen was Eridron vitensis. And I'd never seen this Ken Seth had sent me a photo of it, I think from Capitol Peak. And he's like, what is this? And I'm like, that's a ridge on Vitensis. And I'm never going up on Capitol Peak because I don't like heights. So I'm like, I gotta find this plant somewhere where I'm not gonna be scared to death. So I went into Cynet, which is basically the network of herbaria here in the, U in the Western US. And of course, I think Lorraine's on and Lorraine's one of my heroes. She's probably many of our heroes. And I noticed that she had collected a specimen of it on West Maroon Pass and true to Lorraine, the data was flawless. So I climbed up West Maroon Pass and literally just a couple of meters west of the summit of the pass was a Ridgeron Vitensis in all of its glory. I was also looking for Senecio porteri, I left the eye off that. This was one of those other alpine plants I hadn't seen. This is another scree dweller. Just kind of find it hanging out. Once again, Lorraine's directions were impeccable. It's like three meters west of the summit of West Maroon Pass. There they were hiding in the rocks. I was a little bit scared as I was climbing up the pass. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm almost to the top and I haven't seen either of these plants. Maybe they're no longer there. And then I got, that's not a very wide pass. It's literally only about 20 feet wide before it drops off the other side. Right there, a couple meters was the only place those plants were. So thank you, Lorraine, for your impeccable attention to detail. Uh, just going down the other side, the wildflowers were amazing up in there. It was high enough. They had gotten enough snow last winter that it was actually probably one of the only sound of music moments that I had in 2020 in the Alpine Tundra, where I could just swirl around surrounded by alpine flowers. But uh, it's good to have moments like that. Anemone parviflora, these were by far the best ones I've seen in Colorado. A couple of days prior to this, I was on Horseshoe Mountain with Betty Ford, kind of checking on stuff. And it had been dry enough on Horseshoe that a lot of stuff didn't even flower in 2020 or was long, long past. So it made me a little scared to climb up to West Maroon Pass, but it definitely didn't disappoint. Uh, we're going to skip. We're getting near the end. So thank you guys. You've been very patient. This is uh, near my folks place in North Route County near Steamboat. Uh, as the season progressed, a lot of wildfires popped up. And we had a fire not far from the house. Luckily, I guess if we we're going to have a forest fire, it was the exact direction that I want to have a forest fire. It's to the southeast of the house by about 15 miles. This one never truly, truly took off. It just kind of smoldered from Labor Day into probably November. So here it is on the morning of October 21st. I took a week off and went to Steamboat, something I would never do in a normal year, take the last week of October off and go to North Route County but because it had been mild enough. And I actually climbed up to Gilpin Lake. I'd been wanting to go here again for many years. It's kind of my go-to hike for a lot of the charismatic plants of the Zirkles. 
it's become super popular. So I, I haven't done it in 10 years and I didn't want to do it during the main season this year with COVID. So I'm like on a Wednesday in late October, it's probably the best time to do it. So I got to the parking lot. There were only like three other cars in the parking lot at 7 a.m. when it was 25 degrees. And through the day, I only saw about 10 people. But once again, that's a sign of the times to see 10 people on the Gilpin Lake Trail <laughs> on a Wednesday in late October definitely tells us that it's no longer 1990 in Colorado. Gilpin Lake was in drought mode. I've never seen the lake quite this low. There was actually no water coming out of the outlet. I'm not sure that that's a normal thing or if that's from, from the drought, but normally there's water coming out of the outlet. But I was up there to check on some plants. I'm on a fern kick as well. There's actually, I've been told, believe it or not, almost 70 to 80 species of ferns in Colorado. And so that's another bucket list that I'm trying to check off as many ferns as I can. I had really crappy photos of the alpine holly fern from when I first did digital photography. So I climbed up to check on the colony I knew of and it had actually gotten bigger in the 10 years since I had seen it. So that was a good sign. And then just the native winter green there. I actually never realized it was evergreen. I always thought it was deciduous because when you touch it, it feels like it should be deciduous. And they were looking really good. And of course, Ackerfield also has a great attention to detail. And I'm like, I'm gonna look up if it's evergreen in her book. And sure enough, she says it's evergreen. So the things you never think about. The very next day, Ryan Keene from Yampa River Botanic Garden or formerly of Yampa River Botanic Garden in Steamboat Springs, he's kind of in between jobs at the moment, had wanted to go out to Dinosaur with me. And so I was checking ferns off the checklist. So I said, uh, there's a bunch of ferns out in far Northwest Moffat County. So do you wanna meet me out there and we'll um, see what we can find. So this is late October dinosaur, one of the overlooks, limestone again. So you know there's gonna be fun plants. And we are looking for Pelea breweri, the cliff break fern. And uh, because it was so dry, this is how they looked. So late October in a drought year in a really dry part of Colorado, I don't recommend that you go fern hunting, but we did find it. So that was kind of exciting. There's, I'm pulling on one of the fronds with my fingers. So that's the scale of the plant that we were looking for in this vast landscape. But it lives on north facing limestone cliffs. And I think there's another typo there. I apologize for that. That should say fern. Here's the top of the cliffs that it was living on uh, with arenaria or sandwort and kind of a sagebrush and service berry step in the distance. And then at the very beginning of December, I was still in fern mode and um, someone on Facebook had posted a bunch of ferns down in the San Luis Valley. So I messaged her and asked if she could give me directions and she just said she would show them to me. So typical of COVID time, we set a meeting point in a parking lot <laughs> and I drove the three and a half hours from Denver to the San Luis Valley in December. And she was there in the parking lot and we went for a hike near La Garita into Penitente Canyon, which if any of you have been there, it's a pretty cool place. You don't really think of the San Luis Valley as being a hotspot for ferns, but this canyon has just the right microclimates that it's one of the better spots to see a splenium, trichomanes, a maidenhair spleenwort, and uh, this was on my bucket list. I think there's also male fern in there on the left. We we're a bit thrown off because the male ferns, this is December 5th. We're still green in the crevices of this canyon. Why in late October in Route County, they were brown and dormant. So I don't know if the microclimates are just so good in this canyon that they actually hadn't frosted yet, even though Coming through that morning, 
the thermometer in South Park was registering zero. And I was like, ooh, it's going to be a, a brisk hike. But luckily, by the time I got to the San Luis Valley, because of microclimates and the day progressing, it was 42 degrees at the trailhead. It was actually a beautiful day to hike there. So we don't know if these are just male ferns hanging out or if they're actually an evergreen dryopteris, uh, just hanging out in a super favorable microclimate. And the, the reason these photos are a little dark and grainy is because the ferns are actually living in these crevices that are big enough that I could fit in. And sometimes so far uh, back were the ferns that even if I crawled as far back into the crevice as I could, I couldn't reach them with my arm. So they were way back in these dark, damp crevices actually filled with uh, bat guano and pack rat um, detritus. So um, we were also scared about that kind of poking around. So that's actually the end. So thank you guys. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen.